Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ahmed Shemiri. I had MENA Direct Investments for Sanabal Investments. Please join me in welcoming Kali Kavnas, co-founder, president, and CEO of Crucial. Kali leads Crucial's initiatives at the intersection of energy and compute, overseeing extensive infrastructure spanning power production, data center, and cloud, opera cloud operations. I'm also pleased to introduce Antonio J. Gratias, the founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of Valor Equity Partners. Established in 95, with over 25 years of investment experience, Antonio has served on the boards of pioneering companies, notably as the lead independent director at Tesla. Today, he continues to shape the future as a board member at SpaceX, Zipline, and others. The topic of today needs no introduction. I believe AI has been a major point of discussion throughout this year's FII and past, past years. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you, Antonio. You've been investing since 95. Uh, with AI's rapid descent, you've seen uh, various trends, technology shifts. How are you thinking about positioning Valor's, Valor Equity Partner uh, especially when it comes to investing in AI. Any unique strategies you're employing this time around? Uh, well, first, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting us, and thank you to our friend Sanabla for having us here. We're, we're grateful to be here. Um, I think there are, there, are, there are some things that are the same and some things that are different. You know, in 95, uh, I built a connector company that was uh, making parts for the internet backbone, so backplane assemblies, this kind of thing. And we saw the bubble uh, in, in hardware at that time. And it was, um, you know, I'd say well, the, the, the lesson we learned there was that we want to invest in infrastructure because infrastructure actually allows us to uh, capture returns at lower risk than, than applications. It was very hard to try to figure out what the final application layer was going to be. That, at some level, is the same here. We're doing the same thing. We're investing in infrastructure, and we're looking for applications that only have um, high return capital and very good growth dynamics. The difference for us is that it is now very global. Um, it's a very, we, we were very U.S. centric in those days. Uh, we had factories making stuff around the world, but our demand cycle was in the U.S. Here today, one of the reasons we were here um, in the kingdom is that this is clearly a global change. It's a global change that allows us to I th move from, you know, a paradigm of, uh, of, of some of competition to cooperation, because these models, the, the, the LLMs in particular, I think will change the, the, the calculus between resource utilization and development. And so uh, one of the reasons our firm is spending time in other parts of the world, uh, both working on, on, on this technology shift and um, engaging with uh, various, uh, various governments and, and with folks like you, like you here at Snobble, is that we think it, it, it should be global and we should be part of that global change. We weren't in the last, in the last shift. And when you say working on, you mean that literally. Operational value add is at the core of Valor Equity Partners. It's growth and human capital, as you say. Especially when it comes to AI, do you see the, that factor of being operationally value add and the human capital as an investor more or less important? I think it's always been important. It's important, so it, remain, but it remains important. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have sent teams to help Cully and, and, uh, and Caruso uh, build their first data centers in the, in the oil fields way back when um, and help them help, uh, I think, productize the system they designed. And he can tell you about that. We also uh, had, as an example, seven people uh, at the XAI data center in Memphis um, that were lean operations teams, including our two senior partners, operating partners, uh, David Heskett and, and Tim Watkins. So because of the data, the data center operations are like building factories at some level, right, which is what we did in the old days, it, there's still a real need for operational excellence. Yeah. And what you're seeing, I believe, over time is that the people that are best at building the densest clusters at the lowest cost, the so highest return, they will be the winners. And it's n this is not yet obvious, but I think it will be obvious in the next few years. Interesting. And I would love to get your take and your take, Holly, on this. There has been this thesis that there is the gap between the investment in infrastructure and the revenue generated by AI, and it's estimated at hundreds of billions of dollars. Do you think we're going to find the revenue model that sort of bridges that gap and delivers values to the end user? 
my take on this is I think we're in the classic technology adoption J curve situation here where we're often sort of disappointed really by the obvious productivity gains that happen at the beginning of a technology being implemented and adopted. You sort of overestimate the utility in the near term. And then in the long term, we've vastly underestimated the, the impact and, and the utility. So you could look at another example like electricity. When, ele when electricity was invented, maybe it was obvious that this could have some impact in an industrial setting, you know, turning factories from steam to electrical, but nobody could have imagined semiconductors and the internet and the fang stocks and all of that value being created long term. Um, so, yep, long way of saying my guess is yes, we will find the revenue model and we're probably underestimating how big of a revenue model that will be, but it's hard to know what it exactly will look like. It, it, it still remains to be invented in some ways. And how are you navigating that as an investor, Antonio? Yeah, so it's, um, I think Kelly's right, and I would add that I think that all markets overshoot. Okay, so the reality is I think in the, in the short to medium term, in the short term, we don't have enough capacity. In the medium term, we will overbuild capacity. When we over overbuild capacity, margins will come down across th across the system. And then eventually, as, as Kelly says, the capacity utilized with a bit of a more normalized build cycle. So what we're navigating is, um, we think our, our, our model is always the same, right? We're looking for companies to make the world better. We're looking for companies that are, we call it pro-entropics, they're they, they demand cycles. Their demand is not a function of cyclicality, but it has much more uh, consistent underlying fundamentals. And then thirdly, we're looking for companies that have um, high return on capital, right? So if high return on capital and good growth rates, you will eventually be a winner. The problem in this cycle, as in all prior cycles I've seen, is that um, people remember the growth term, well, high growth, they forget the return on capital. <laughs> okay, so they just, ROIC doesn't matter when you're in this giant build and all this promise of the future. Uh, unfortunately, I must tell everyone that ROIC does matter, sorry. And many of the companies we see just won't produce ROIC. I think that Caruso, the interesting thing about Caruso is that they began the business from first principles with a mind toward in return on invested capital um, in all of their data centers from the, from the first editions in the oil fields in South Dakota, all the way to what they're building today, 700 megawatts in Abilene, Texas. Um, so Kali, as someone who's benefiting from the investment in the infrastructure, Caruso started out as y using flared gas to mine Bitcoin and quickly shifted into high performance computing and AI compute and today you're fully embracing AI. You're, I believe, building a data center in Texas that's north of 200 megawatts. Um, when, when did you see this shift in AI and what, what, what made you decide to sort of double down on AI and fully embrace it? You know the story very well. Um, we, the Crusoe is really a, a company that was founded out of the backgrounds of myself in the energy industry and my, my co-founder Chase Lockmiller from the technology industry. He, has, he had a deep background in, in artificial intelligence, did a master's degree at Stanford in AI and used that as a, um, as a platform for quant hedge fund trading early in his career. I started my career in the geothermal energy industry and then later into the oil and gas industry, uh, coming from a family background of oil and gas entrepreneurs. Um, and we, we, we did have this insight where Chase was able to see around the corner that GPU compute would be the long-term opportunity for AI. He was paying enough power bills as a user of early AI models to predict securities prices that he could understand where that scaling law was going to go. Um, and, and I knew enough about the energy industry to understand there's a lot of energy being wasted throughout the economy in the United States and, and, and internationally. So we put these two ideas together and we started capturing wasted and stranded energy sources, first flared gas, um, and, and more recently curtailed renewables and other forms of, of disadvantaged energy um, to, to power high performance computing. Um, so we used Bitcoin mining as a early beachhead to get into converting energy to computing revenue. It was technically a faster and more, and more straightforward approach than trying to go out and build a cloud product from scratch as a small company. But that gave us the resources and the entrees to, uh, to eventually build a cloud product focused on GPU compute clusters for AI model training and inference, and then most recently building hyperscale data centers with what we've learned from operating a cloud to actually building 100 plus megawatt hyperscale data centers specifically tailored for the most cutting edge training workloads at energy first sites. 
Um, so it, it's really been part of our vision since the beginning. We began deploying GPUs in 2021 um, and then ChatGPT came out and everything went pretty crazy and uh, we've been responding to that de demand ever since. And, and Crusoe, especially today, is an interesting place because you sit at the intersection of energy and compute. And energy increasingly is, increasing is emerging as the bottleneck even more than chip demand these days, right? How should investors, founders, and leaders think about the energy sort of bottleneck and challenge? What is the opportunity there, and how, how are you at Crusoe? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, Energy really has become the constraint more so than chips. And it's not just access to energy in general, it's access to very large amounts of power at one spot, ideally clean power, has to be consistent and reliable power. And it has to be available soon. Time to market is a very big component of this market situation right now. Uh, so Crusoe's expertise has always been at the intersection of energy and finding interesting lower cost, environmentally aligned energy sources, and then bringing computing to these places that historically never would have had a data center. So starting off in North Dakota in the Bakken oil field, Antonio was very brave as an investor, by the way. He was the first investor to actually fly up to North Dakota in a snowstorm and yeah. see what we were doing. And I think through that you saw, okay, these people are building advanced technology in places that's a very rugged environment. And this sort of fit with Valor's uh, operationally intense approach to investment. Um, and, and that's true today. I mean, data centers used to be built where there's network connectivity near population centers. Our thesis is that the future of data centers as it relates to AI, specifically training, is energy first. Uh, latency is not as big of a factor in a training process. The energy, the availability of it, and the cost and the environmental performance of it, those are, we think, the most important screening criteria. So that's how we've built our, our portfolio of more than 10 gigawatts of opportunities, is energy first, uh, climate aligned, and economically you know, sort of driven energy selections. And Antonio, you've mentioned that the, the nature of the cycle that we might overbuild, but also ROIC is very important, right? Is how, how do we navigate that risk for people not to sort of get burned and regress when it comes to, to AI? Uh, we're going to overbuild it in terms of capacity, you think. Um, how do we navigate that risk, again, as investors and founders? It's a great question, actually. Um, you want to focus on invest management teams um, like Chase and Cully that think about both growth and return on capital. Because the, the, for sure there'll be an overbuilding cycle. The question is, what happens when overbuilds, and how do, you, how do your executives respond in your companies? Um, what, what Chase and uh, Cully and were so good at, and the reason we were so impressed with them is, coming out of the gate, they built uh, data centers in the oil fields in the Bakken to um, mine Bitcoin, right? Th because no one is going to give you a contract, you know, we, uh, to to build a data center for a big company uh, in, in an oil field, right? It's, it sounded crazy at the time, and it was crazy at the time, which is what I loved about it. It was a little crazy. I almost caught myself on fire there, actually, with one of the, one of the heaters. So, um, but the 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 when you peel that back and you think, okay, guys, why? Well, we don't want to invest a billion dollars and then hope to get revenue. We want revenue right now, and then we'll go get the big contracts. We'll learn a lot here, and then get the contracts. That mindset that Cully has, that is the mindset you want. And so there will be an overbuild. I think that our, our team here at Crusoe will survive and make money and thrive, right? They'll be good at that chaos because their mindset is about growth and return on capital. They will figure out the right thing to do. We will try to help them, but we're betting on the right people, fundamentally. That's the answer. And the right people for us are people to think about return on capital, being very good capital allocators, and being thoughtful when the cycle breaks. They will do that. Nice. Um, one thing that we think about at Senabil is building a time diversified portfolio. So what I mean is, um, it's estimated that 1% of today's global internet market cap was created in the two years following the creation of Netscape, right? We're, we're in that timeline if you take ChatGPT as the Netsca Netscape of today. What this might mean that 99% of the value that's going to be created is still yet to be created and it's yet to be created by companies that haven't even been founded. Do you agree with that and how, again, as investors and founders. We're still in the first two years 
and majority of the value is yet to be created. Do you agree with that, and how should we think about it? So please. I, I do agree with that. I think it's back to this, this J-curve concept, and I'll use the example of electricity maybe in a little yeah. bit more detail. Um, I, again, when, when Thomas Edison was building out sort of the first small utilities in a, a, su a subset of New York and Manhattan, um, maybe you could have anticipated there'd be bigger utilities or regional utilities, but nobody could have imagined how many innovations and companies would be born from this as a platform technology. And you could say this about many of these platform technologies that emerge, but um, you know, the internet would not be possible. You think about ASML, TSMC, and NVIDIA, very much in the news these days. None of this exists without electricity, obviously. Uh, Meta, Microsoft, Amazon, none of these companies exist without electricity. So obviously 99% plus of the value creation from that platform shift happened well after the invention of the technology. And uh, I'm just predicting that we would see a similar pattern here. Yeah, so I, I think that the, um, I, just to add something different to the conversation, I think the 1% <coughs> is, is correct. However, I think that the moment to measure it from is actually AlphaGo. So we invested in, in uh, DeepMind in 2013. We've been watching artificial intelligence for years. I mean, much bef long before it op entered the popular lexicon, I think ChatGPT is kind of the, the aha moment for the, the average person. But for, for those of us who were deep in the space and looking at hard tech, it was really, it was a deep mind. So we invest in deep mind 2013, Google buys it, very painful for us, Google buys it. And um, AlphaGo for me, which is 2016, 17, was the moment I was like, okay, it's something that's gonna happen. The value that created to NVIDIA, Google, Meta, it, they've created massive amounts of value already, right? So that's years ago that's been happening. So I think the 1% is correct. It should be measured from, uh, I'd say, from my perspective, from AlphaGo. And then I will tell you that the difference between now and prior cycles, the internet and others, is that there are a couple of, there, there are a few very large, basically monopoly, if not oligopoly companies, right? Google, Meta, Microsoft. Microsoft and Google together control, I don't know, 80, 90% of the search market in the US for sure. Um, this is an oligopoly, if not a monopoly. They've already created a lot of value, we just don't see it. And so in the internet, you had lots of new companies being built and it was all kind of startups that took all the value. In this cycle, I think some reasonable percentage of the value will accrete to companies that already existed. Mm -hmm. In the hardware side, so in the data center and in the application layer. On the data center, NVIDIA, obviously, many of the data center offers already existed, obviously. And on the application side, I think Google, Meta, Microsoft, others, they will accrete some value in the application layer. The startup world, I think will also do very well, but it will be f less of the value will accrete to the startup world in this cycle than you saw on the internet. And so maybe that's a good, good point to close on, that are the leaders that are in these big companies, but also the startup founders. Um, what compass should we use to navigate and to what you call it, Antonio, you believe is the Star Trek future versus the Terminator future? How should we navigate to make sure that we end up with a Star Trek future? I'm, uh, it's a great question. It's the thing I worry about the most and the thing I work on the hardest, which is how do we get to a positive future of humanity, a Star Trek future? And I think this is really more about um, the global regime we operate in, which is why I think it's important for all of us uh, to be involved together in this conversation around the world. That is, models will be imbued with the value of their creator. An, an artificial neural network is, a, is exactly like a neural network. It will reflect whatever ethics, morals, and values you teach it. And in a world where we are all different and there are um, competitive dynamics going on, I think we need to be careful. This is a little like nuclear energy and, and nuclear weapons. We have to think about this as how do we teach these models to cooperate, not compete. And if they do compete, they compete within boundaries that are good for humanity, not bad for humanity, right? We don't, we don't weaponize them. We teach them actually to be uh, good to humans, not bad to humans, even though we might think that one particular uh, a sovereign may want to use it in some way. I think this is very important. It's very, very important that the, the we recognize that um, these models and this technology can, can be weaponized and we have to be careful about the regime we operate in globally. So we teach them to cooperate and if they do, they do compete, they compete in a way that is boundaried so that it's good for all of us. This is a time where I think we could go from mutual assured destruction in nuclear weapons to what I'll call mutual assured development. We can actually 
all get better together without destroying the planet because this technology is that powerful. All right. It's a great point to close on. Mutual issue development. Thank you all for joining us. Now join me in thanking Antonio and Khalid for this panel. Thank you. Thank you.